ICFRC hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible since 1983, the year when, pause for dramatic effect, the first Hooters restaurant opened in Clearwater, Florida. Hmm. Not one of our, our most uh, attractive uh, uh, memories, but okay. Uh, I want to acknowledge the university and community supporters. Uh, we are grateful for the financial support of the University of Iowa International Programs, its Honors Program, and its Center for Public Policy, along with the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization. Thanks also to today's special sponsors, Midwest One Bank, Alan Swanson, Blank and McCune Realtors, and John Menninger. Also, thanks to City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2 and the U of I Library's digital archives. Please note as well that over 220 ICFRC podcasts are now available wherever you get your podcasts. So it's my pleasure to introduce Danielle Lussier. As I said, she's Associate Professor of Political Science at Grinnell College. Her research examines democratization, political participation, and religion and politics. She is the author of Constraining Elites in Russia and Indonesia, which came out from Cambridge University Press in 2016. For this book, she conducted extensive field work in both Russia and Indonesia. And she was able to explain why Russia, which early on seemed to have the social conditions to make its transition to democracy a success, failed to do so. Yet Indonesia, where the social conditions seemed hostile to democracy, has managed to keep its democracy in operation. It turns out it very much depends on whether the public stays engaged and participates in ways that constrain the elites to force them to follow rules. That is, I would suggest, a lesson that pertains beyond those two countries. <laughs> More recently, Danielle has been taking a deeper look at Russia's elites. Those are the unconstrained ones. <laughs> and I'm pleased she's agreed to share some of her findings with us today. Please welcome Danielle Lucier. Thank you so much, uh, Bill, for that warm introduction. And thank you, uh, everyone, for this invitation to be here today. I'm just absolutely delighted to participate in this community conversation about a topic that is so important to me. So the, the title of my presentation is Political Elites in, in Putin's Russia, Ideology, Foreign Policy, and Public Support. And this is based on some ongoing research that I'm doing. It, it, it builds off of my book. Um, and I'm going to apologize in advance that some of the things I'm going to talk about are a little technical, and I just hope that you'll bear with me because I'm going to try to explain them in, in, in very basic language that we can all understand. But honestly, to get at the root of some of this stuff, you kind of have to dig deep and, and deal with some complex issues at times. So I'm going to, by way of introduction, I'm going to start off by sharing two graphs with you and then another piece of information that at first glance seemed pretty unconnected. Would help if I turned my clicker on. OK, so up here is a graph that shows how Russia became more authoritarian over time. So this red line here is a line that tracks what are called Freedom House scores. So Freedom House is an organization that publishes annual scores on freedom in the world. So countries um, that score in the higher range up here are considered free democracies. And countries that score in the lower range down here are considered to be not free, autocratic. And this red line tracks Russia's Freedom House scores going back to when the Soviet Union first collapsed in 1991. So you'll see that Russia never climbs all the way up into this higher range of of, of democracy, but it did it did hold some ground in this middle section and then has gradually, over the past 15, 20 years, really moved into a more autocratic direction. The white lines in this graph represent the different um, terms that President Putin has held in office, his first term, his second term. This blank column in here is when Dmitry Medvedev was president and Putin played the more shadow role of prime minister. Then his third term and his fourth term has just begun at, in, in the end of 2018. So we don't really have a lot of traction on that. So you'll notice that Putin is largely Putin, Putin's presidency largely corresponds to this decline in democracy or this re-autocratization in Russia. So now I want you to look at the second graph. Now what this is, is Putin's approval rating. 
And this um, is conduct. This is data that's conducted by the Levada Center, which is a public opinion um, polling center in in Moscow. And the black line is Putin's approval, and the blue line is his disapproval. And this goes back to when he first became prime minister in 1999. And they've gathered these data on an almost monthly basis. So um, you know, I recognize this is small. So one of the points I want to make is that he's never dipped, even at his lowest point. This man has never dipped below a 60 percent approval rating. Okay, that's and an American president would be very enviable of that sort of an approval rating. Um, so, you know, this looks pretty disconnected from here. OK, so this is a man who is, has really taken apart democracy in Russia, and he's really still quite popular. OK, so maybe these things are completely separate. I'm going to ask you to bear with me while I sort of throw another little bit of, of information in here. And this is, I want to share with you just a little bit of background about Russian foreign policy. So generally, Russian foreign policy under President Yeltsin, who was president in Russia from 1991 through 1999 was generally much more cooperative with the West. And in fact, we often look at that 1990s period as the first several years was a period when the United States and Russia, when Russia was seeking active engagement with the United States. And then maybe in the second half of the 1990s, more, more about balancing its power with the United States. And then once Putin came to power, uh, there was a shift, and at, at first that shift was maybe gradual. So maybe for the first two, his first two terms, and that period of time when he was prime minister, he was balancing power with the West. But since 2012, we've seen a real challenge in the foreign policy priorities of Russia. Um, and in particular, sort of two examples that stand out are ones that I'm sure you're familiar with, which was first the Russian acquisition or annexation of Crimea in 2014, and another one being Russia's military intervention in Syria. This was the first time that Russia became militarily involved in a territory that was not previously part of the Soviet Union. So if we think about this shift to a more assertive or aggressive foreign policy, there are a few possible explanations for it. One is that Putin's personal ambitions um, and his consideration of Russia's national interests have, have pushed him to be more assertive. You know, and another way of thinking about it is that we in the West maybe haven't adequately considered Russia's security threats, that, that Russia faces real, you know, this is the largest country in the world. It spans two continents. It has genuine national interests and security needs that aren't going to be fully met by integrating with Western political institutions. And a third possible argument is that really what this is about, this, uh, this aggressive turn, is about Putin creating a sense of national identity that emphasizes a more aggressive and assertive Russia. So my uh, presentation today, you know, is to the first thing I'm going to really be exploring is, is asking this question of, you know, how are Russian authoritarian Russian authoritarianism, support for Putin, and this aggressive foreign policy um, connected? Because I think that they are connected in some way. So um, to do that, I'm going to talk about the role of ideas and ideology. So first, I'm going to explain the possible role that ideology and ideas play in shaping Russian foreign policy. And then I'm actually going to share with you some very specific analysis that I've been doing over the past year uh, that uses a survey of Russian foreign policy elites to try to better understand the ideas that may be motivating foreign policy decision making. So I'm going to talk about the analytical approach that I've taken and share my findings um, and discuss what the implications of these findings are. Now before I do that, I am going to step back for a little bit and talk about um, the findings from my book, Constraining Elites, which uh, Bill shared very, very clearly in his introductory remarks. Um, in that book, I make an argument that this red line that I showed, with, showed you early on, I make an argument that that is largely explained by patterns in non-voting political participation. So my claim in this book is that when a democratic regime is in its early stages of development, citizens really need to engage in participatory behaviors that constrain elites in order to ensure that elections become and remain democratic. And I argue that Russians have generally adopted what I call elite enabling forms of political participation. And this allowed Russian political elites to build substantial formal and informal political authority that they then used to gradually remove 
the institutions that provided space for the development of democracy. And in my book, I argue that the prevalence of this elite enabling participation in Russia can be explained by low levels of engagement in, in civil society, widespread belief that elite enabling acts are efficacious, that they're actually influential in the political system, and more, perhaps most importantly, greater trust in individuals rather than institutions. So there was this enormous trust that Russians placed in the identity of Vladimir Putin, and that that contributed in part to their selection of participatory mechanisms that built up this informal authority rather than um, helping, helping to bolster democratic institutions. OK, so why is Putin's approval so high, right? This is an interesting question. You know, I mentioned before, this man has been in and out of power for almost 20 years, and yet he's, his approval rating has n never dropped below 60%. And there's a lot of different theories about this. A lot of scholars have emphasized the, the role that Putin played in creating a social contract with the Russian population. The 1990s were a period of, of enormous political and economic turbulence for the average Russian. Part of what Putin did in his first two terms in office was contribute to a more ordered society, uh, a situation where laws were more clearly defined and clearly respected, and dramatically improved the material conditions of the average Russian. This was in part uh, made possible by the increased price of oil on the international market that made it possible for the Russian state to be able to afford greater social welfare programs. But that early approval actually starts to drop shortly after the Great Recession and the beginning of Putin's third term. So, Back to my approval chart here, you know, you'll notice there's kind of a dip right around here. And that's right around the time that, that the Great Recession happened. Um, and then we see this jump in approval right around here. Kind of spikes really dramatically. Right around spring 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea. Scholars have put forth a number of arguments that connect Russia's more assertive foreign policy with this approval. Putin began promoting a view of Russia as a great power and a global leader willing to stand up for its interests against the preferences of the West. One particular version of this argument have, has been promoted by a couple of scholars, Bunsen and Hozik, who suggests that some of what Russia is doing is what they call diffusion proofing, by which they mean they're trying to actually prevent the spread of pro-democracy ideas that are happening not within Russia, but on countries that border Russia, or countries that Russians see, them, see themselves identifying with from taking place in Russia. So it's sort of an aggressive form of maintaining authoritarianism. So what's the role, what role does ideology or ideas play in this. Um, so I want to start off maybe by talking a little bit about some definitions. Ideology is what I, as a social scientist, would call an essentially contested concept. Um, there's no universally agreed upon scholarly definition of, of ideology, right? It's something what I think an ideology is might be some might be very different than what any of any of you around the table think an ideology is. Um, but we can think about it in at least two ways. One way we can think about ideology is it's actors' theorization of their own position, right? So how it is that they they theorize their actions. Another way we might think about ideology is as an ethical set of ideals, principles, doctrines, myths, or symbols based on normative evaluations of how society should work. Now, however we define ideology, we recognize that a key feature of holding an ideology is being able to see how certain preferences fit together. So for example, if you are in favor of lower taxes, you should also be in favor of limiting government spending, right? Because you can't have a government that has a lot, that, that spends a lot of money if you're not going to tax people. And I'm hearing laughter because we all know people who hold these conflicting ideas, right? So that's an example of someone who maybe doesn't have a tightly constrained ideology. They don't necessarily understand how certain preferences fit together. How, understanding how these preferences fit together is something that we might call ideological constraint. So to what extent are your ideas constrained? 
Now, in 1964, a famous political scientist, Philip Converse, conducted this very interesting study um, of both American elites and the average public. It was based on these extensive interviews. And one of the things that he found is that very few individuals actually express genuine ideological constraint. Right? Very few people understand how all of the different things that they claim to be in support of fit together. Nevertheless, people might have preferences that fit together in ways that are not always entirely logical to an outsider, but make a lot of sense to that particular um, individual. And because of that, Converse gave us a new, con a different concept and I'm, that I'm going to share with you, and it was this idea of a belief system. And he defined this belief system as a configuration of ideas and attitudes in which the elements are bound together by some form of constraint or functional interdependence. So a belief system might not necessarily be connected to a particular uh, political philo philosophy or any type of philosophy for that matter, um, but it, it might have a clear logic that makes sense to that particular individual. And I think that this concept is very helpful in studying ideas and convictions in the post-communist world. Um, Russia is a place where many of the abstract concepts that we associate with political ideology, things like liberalism, conservatism, socialism, communism, are very loaded terms. And how people understand those terms in, in Russia is likely shaped in many very in very specific ways with their own interaction with political reform and change and transformation that has happened. And, and that their understandings of those terms might be very different than my more narrow academic understanding of them. So what do we know about Russian ideological space? We actually know very little about the ideological conviction, convictions of Russian, Russia's political elite. The, the overall ideological spectrum in Russia is really unclear. So one of the things that political scientists have, have come to learn is that the idea of a left-right continuum, a liberal conservative continuum, is pretty widespread from in most uh, advanced democracies. Now, we might think about it as having two dimensions, right? There, we often think of, of that spectrum as having a social dimension and a separate economic dimension. So you can have individuals who are, both, who are socially conservative and economically liberal and vice versa. But that spectrum doesn't seem to, to explain the ideological space in Russia. Um, Early research found, uh, earlier research, including some research that I, I conducted on mass opinions in the 1990s, found a belief system that was organized around the lived experience of communism. So there, so Russians sometimes, especially in the 1990s, really associated themselves as either supporting elements of the communist state and the way that life was organized under it or being in opposition to it. But that's just one, one dimension, and as we're several years away, from the experience of the so of Soviet life, that dimension doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, what we do know is that elite debate in the 1980s and the 1990s was often framed very much in pro-reform or anti-reform positions, but even the types of positions that people took had multiple dimensions to them, right? They had to do with questions about not just communist or anti-communist, communist, but whether or not national identity was something that was ethnic in nature or if it was something that was more um, civic in nature, um, relationships to socialism and capitalism, uh, any number of different cleavages that existed. So this experience suggests that Russian beliefs they could be organized in a number of different ways. And, and maybe we haven't even really figured out what those are, and they may or may not align with political theories that we want to impose on them. So this led to, motivated the, the research that I'm now going to share with you. So one of the things that I, I want to um, point out is that most of the work that's trying to understand Russian ideology uses a very specific type of um, method, and that's uh, discourse analysis, where people analyze speeches and published reports and look for themes in them. And I'm doing something different. I am researching, I'm using a survey of Russian political elites 
to, to analyze this method. Um, this is a survey, it's a, an opinion survey, anonymous opinion survey, um, in which the samples comprised of members of the Russian Foreign Policy League. And this survey has actually been conducted over seven waves, going back from 1993, and the most recent wave um, having been completed in 2016. And I'm exploring four research questions using the survey. So the first is, do attitudes expressed by members of the Russian foreign policy elite, do they form a constrained belief system? If so, what's the content of it? How are their ideas structured? How are they interconnected? Do different groups within that foreign policy community show different types of ideological attachments? And how have they changed over time? Now, I'm not the first person to attempt this sort of research. The, there has been some work that's used uh, opinion surveys to try to understand ide um, ideology a little bit, and uh, I want to share some of that with you. Um, in particular, a, a distinguished group of Iowa political scientists, um, Miller, Hesley, and Reisinger, wrote several papers in the 1990s that were based on surveys of both citizens and elites in Russia and Ukraine. And one of the papers that they, they produced um, uses an approach very similar to what I'm doing here. In fact, I used their work as a model for this, um, for this particular research. Um, they identified four dimensions along which Russians uh, had sort of constrained beliefs. One was attitudes towards reform. A second had to do with um, tendencies towards, towards nationalism, preferences up for a market economy, and democratic principles. Now, notably, their, the focus of their research was, not, was on domestic reform. So they didn't actually look at questions that measured attitudes towards foreign policy. So th that's a distinction from what I'm doing. Another scholar um, conducted an analysis on ideological constraint among foreign policy elites in the 1990s and generally found that elites tended to have more constrained beliefs. Um, this is consistent with what we know in general in cross-national research. So a lot of times citizens might tend to follow the patterns that are set by elites um, in terms of, of how they put together their preferences. And in a more recent study, a couple of scholars found that Russian anti-Americanism is really an elite-led phenomenon. So how do I go about doing this? So this is where I'm going to ask you to just bear with me for a minute as I talk a little bit about technical pieces. So I used a, st a statistical method known as factor analysis, which is a data reduction technique. I'm not going to go into detail here on how it works. If you're somebody who's really interested in the nitty gritty of it, please email me and I'd be happy to share those details with you. But suffice it to say that this is a, a data reduction technique that's commonly used to look for whether or not People answer survey questions in similar ways, right? So if you're given 20 different survey questions, are your answers really predictable by maybe how you might um, how you might answer one question? Does that do a good job of predicting how you might answer others? So it's a way of trying to understand whether or not there is sort of an unobservable, unobservable cluster or set of ideas that help to predict um, this larger number of questions. So I uh, analyzed 19 survey questions using this method from seven ways of the of this survey of Russian elites, so from 1993 up through 2016, and I selected questions that addressed both domestic and foreign policy concerns. So the um, domestic policy politics that I looked at, I looked at 10 questions that involved the level of agreement with a number of features in domestic politics um, that looked at reform from Soviet era institutions. So these questions comprised attitudes towards civil society um, and civil rights, freedom of speech, political competition, and development of a market economy, including some questions about ownership and economic inequality. Uh, I also looked at nine foreign policy questions that uh, included questions about U.S. Poli um, policies, relations with the United States, relations with the former Soviet states, military assistance, um, and the role of the military force in determining power in international relations. So what my analysis produced was that I looked at these 19 questions to look to see how do they, how do they fit together. And I found that two dimensions uh, emerged where we see clusters of particular attitudes holding together. So one set of questions, there were four questions here um, that I've, I've got up on the slide, but I'll read them because I don't know how clear this is. But these were agree, disagree questions. Competition among political parties will make our system stronger. Competition among organizations and firms benefits society. 
it's normal when a business owner becomes richer than others, and all heavy industries should belong to the state. So these, these sorts of questions, people, they hung together in the way that people answered them. Uh, and five questions about foreign policy really hung together. Uh, they had to do with Stalin is blamed for things he didn't do. Uh, the United States is a threat to Russian national security. How friendly is, is the U.S. to Russia? So either very friendly or not very friendly. Um, military force decides everything. And the growth of the U.S. military, is, military power is dangerous to Russia. So answers to these questions also tended to cluster together. So if you, if you just sort of look at the content of those questions, we... I would interpret them as sort of showing us two different types of belief systems that come out of this. So this first one, this, this domestic politics belief system, it's really about competition in the political sphere. So what's, or, or the social sphere more broadly. What's telling to me isn't just which questions are included, but which ones don't tend to associate with these. Notice no questions about freedom of speech or civil rights or those sorts of questions come up here. Really, this is just about how comfortable are you with a certain degree of competition in political and economic spheres. The foreign policy questions similarly really tend to structure around animosity towards the United States. Notice that no questions that have anything to do with relationships with other former Soviet states are present in there. Um, I had some questions about Europe. They don't associate, right? So what we really see here is this cluster of beliefs about um, animosity towards the United States. So the next thing I did was I took the que these questions here, and I created, um, I took the responses to them, and I created two indices that looked at um, domestic and foreign policy responses. So I created an, I, I changed the variables around a little bit so that I have an index where uh, on domestic politics where zero means that you are completely pro-reform. You want competition in all these things. And one means you're anti-reform. And people could score anywhere between zero and one on this. And I created a foreign policy index that similarly, zero means you do not have animosity towards the US. You are in favor, you don't see the US as a threat. You're in favor of sort of a deeper cooperation where one is a more anti-US position. Now I'm gonna share with you um, some figures that look at this a little bit. And these are box plots. So to, the way that we interpret this is the, the line in the middle is the median and the blue squares on either side are sort of the 50% around the median. And the, these bigger lines are sort of the, the other two quartiles, OK? It just tells us a little bit something about the distribution. And this goes over time. Now, this is for domestic politics. We see pretty insignificant change over time. And something I'd like to point out is most of the distribution is in the lower end of my index. That means that most Russian foreign policy elites were actually in favor of some of this political and economic competition. So nothing so interesting here. Now, these box, plot, box plots on foreign policy are actually quite a bit more interesting to look at. So if we look just at the end poll, so 1993 and 2016, it looks as though Russian elites have become more anti-American over time. So the, the, the plot moves pretty dramatically from one poll to the other. But there's actually quite a bit of movement even within this, right? So for example, we see that uh, the, the median level of hostility in 2012 is actually quite a bit lower than it is in, in 2016. Um, and it's lower than at any year other than 1993. Um, and we also see that positions in this index became more compressed in 2016, so more people are sort of clustering around this anti-US position in the, in the elite. Now, this variation very likely reflects very real differences in the foreign policies that were practiced under Yeltsin and Putin. Another way that I looked at these, um, at this information, was by subgroups of the elite. So this survey was done to, to look at foreign policy elites. It was, the sample was collected to look at foreign policy elites in five different groups, from the media, from science and education, from the economy, from the legislative and executive branches of government, and then also from the, from the military and security agencies. And so this box plot here, just, this just looks at that um, foreign policy index um, of the mili, whoops, sorry, I went too fast here. This is just by those different groups. So we see some interesting, interesting differences here. Media elites, 
and those in science and technology tend to hold more favorable positions to the U.S. than elites in the military um, and other groups, for example. Um, nevertheless, we don't see you know a, a lot here of um, a, a lot of difference. This plot doesn't tell us change over time, so that reveals a slightly more compl complex picture. Um, so I wanted to look a little bit more closely at this military and security elite group. So I created a graph here that looks at them by years. And here we see th sort of things moving all over the place, right? How military elites, their, their positions, whether or not they've seen themselves as more anti or less um, or more pro-U.S. Um, varies quite a bit. They were most anti-U.S. actually in 2008. Um, and then they actually become more favorable to the U.S. over time. Um, the vo this volatility, I think, likely reflects um, reactions to military involvement in post-Soviet countries, and as well as the ratification of a new START treaty in 2010. These events were probably particularly significant for military elites. Um, now, these, these plots provide a helpful overview of Russian elite belief systems. Uh, you know, they, they don't tell us a lot about the strength of those convictions and their consistency over time. And to try to look at that, I, I calculated some other statistics um, that I, I think I'm probably not going to go into a lot of detail because I don't know that, that they will be that, that helpful, um, except for to say that one of the things that I found is that we see the connections between these questions actually breaking down over time with regard to this military and, and military elite, this military and security elite. That overall, over time, their ideas become less constrained. And the other thing that I think is, is interesting to, to consider with this is I looked at to what extent these ideas hold together more tightly among Russian elites compared to elites in other countries. And so I looked at some of the findings from other scholars and found that on the whole, generally speaking, Russian elites tend to have less constrained beliefs than American um, and other European elites do. Okay, so I'm gonna, I think I'll just gloss over my next two slides because I don't think that they're the most helpful right now for us to talk about. Instead, I want to sort of summarize these main findings and then talk a little bit more about the next stage of my analysis. So just to summarize what I showed you, um, military and security elites are distinct from elites from other categories, and that they display weaker ideological constraint on both foreign and domestic policy dimensions. Military elites also hold the strongest anti-US position on the foreign policy index and the strongest anti-reform position on the domestic policy index. Um, there was a stronger, this is part of what I glossed over, there was actually a stronger correlation um, in elites' opinions in the 1990s and the two, than in the 2000s. So this suggests that elites in the 1990s actually held stronger convictions that helped to explain um, their view, their preferences in one area their preferences in one area helped to explain their preferences in another area in a more predictable fashion 20 years ago than they do today. So we're seeing this weakening of constraint over time. And the last thing I, I will summarize is just that elites positioning on this, what I'm calling a foreign policy belief system, it's become more inconsistent over time. So even though we st I still find evidence that these attitudes kind of cluster together, um, it doesn't seem to structure all views, right? Instead, what we see is that you've got, you've got foreign policy elites who hold opinions that are hard to actually pin down and predict and, and show in a very consistent fashion. So these findings raise to me a number of other questions. Um, Russians' el elite po um, elites positioning on these two belief systems, it's changed both over time but we also see there's meaningful variation between what position you are in the elite. Are you in the military or elite? Are you in educationally? Are you a legislator? Which is more important? Which matters? Is it, is it that change over time is more significant or is it change across groups that's more significant? Um, so in order to try and better understand what explains that shift, I um, calculated a number of other statistical analyses. So um, again, for those in the room who might be more fluent in statistics, uh, I'll just tell you what I did so that you're aware. Um, I did pooled cross-sectional 
ordinarily squares analyses on the this full sample. Um, and I and what I did was I looked at several different factors that might help to explain differences in how one positions themselves on these indices. I looked at questions of membership in different elite groups. I looked at some elements of political affiliation. And I also looked at year, change over time. So now I'm going to share with you two extraordinarily complex graphs that I'm going to patiently explain because I think that you will find them worth listening to my explanation about. <laughs> so this first one, so I'm just going to explain this to you. Up here on this left-hand side are all of the different factors I looked at as trying to maybe explain change in, um, in these indices. So there's uh, four different categories of um, elite groups, whether you're media, science, technology, economy, or military. I looked at whether or not you belong to a political party whether or not you were identified with the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, which was the primary opposition force in the 1990s, whether you identified with the pro-Putin United Russia Party, whether or not you were a former member of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and then I looked at each of these years. Okay, now what you see over here, I want you to just pay attention to this red line. If a line crosses this red line, it simply means that that factor didn't explain <coughs> any of the differences that we saw in positioning, right? That people who had this or that factor were no different than those who did not. If, some, if this line doesn't cross the red line, that means, hey, this helps to explain why a group, if they're on the right side line, is more anti-reform, and if they're on the left side, why they're less anti-reform. So what I can conclude here is that being in the military and security group made, makes a person much more less likely to support competition in the political sphere in Russia. Um, and also, being part or identifying with the Communist Party of the Russian Federation also contributes to that. We see that, you know, elites became more anti-American over time, but that doesn't seem to be as big of a deal, right? It's not as far away from the line as this stuff is. And then this is just with regard to domestic politics. Now I did the same analysis with Russian with the foreign policy. And this I think is really quite interesting because what we see here is that pretty much all of these identity factors matter, right? Being a member of the military and security elite makes you more anti-American. Um, sympathizing with the Communist Party of the Russian Federation or the pro-Putin party makes you more anti-American. Having been a member of the Communist Party makes you more anti-American. But more importantly, what all of these lines over here tell us is that just the passage of time are making foreign policy elites more anti-American. Even irrespective of their identity categories, just the passage of time is contributing to this, this sense of anti-Americanism. So what are some of the implications of this? I think there are several. The results of my analysis, they support arguments um, about the importance of elite attachments in shaping ideas about national identity. So in particular, the identification of beliefs organized along a dimension about attitudes towards the US fits into a broader narrative about Putin's emphasis on Russia as a great power that does not accept international no norms as defined by the West. So if we think just back fr from a historical perspective, um, in the 1990s, I'm sure many of you remember, there was a lot of discussion about the end of history. The West has won, sort of this idea that for at least the second half of the, of the 20th century, the international space was, was fighting from was fighting a battle, an ideological battle between democracy and capitalism versus communism, and that it was very clear that this, the West had won this ideological battle. And communism surely has lost. That, that, that's without question. But Putin is potentially trying to build this other narrative that says, hey, democracy, capitalism, as you define them in the West, does not have to be the only type of frame that we organize our national identity around, or our foreign policy around. And my, my research t tends to support that interpretation of things. Nevertheless, the low level of ideological constraint among Russian foreign policy elites um, suggests that their core beliefs are actually rather shallow. Um, 
And if such beliefs are not actually deeply held convictions, it's possible that they're maybe more reactive than determinative of policy. And that consequently, maybe they're more malleable, right? They're more reactive rather than, than willing to sort of stay a particular policy course. And I would also add that the absence of ideological constraint around foreign policy issues other than hostility to the US leaves few core principles that we can think about for policy organization, right? If you think about this exclusively from a policy perspective, you know, we're often encouraged, you know, when I teach courses or, or I'm in conversations, I'm always thinking, okay, what's the common ground we can find, right? You, you hear this all the time, I think, especially in discussions about diplomacy. Where can we meet each other part way for productive policy dialogue? Well, you know, if the only core convictions that we see really present in the Russian foreign policy elite is animus to the United States, I'm not really sure what that productive ground is for, for policy deliberation. Um, and some scholars have gone so far as to argue that this is precisely why there has been such limited cooperation between Russia and not only the United States, but parts of, of Europe. That sort of this, the, the ability to even find core, enough core convictions is, is lacking. So this leads me to sort of back to my initial point about Putin's popularity and the role of, of Putin in this. So how do these ideas, how does this animus towards uh, the United States as a foreign policy belief system, how does this view of domestic policy really just being clustered around questions of either being supportive of competition or against it, how do, this, how do they relate both to Putin's popularity and to the consolidation of authoritarianism in Russia? I have a few ideas. One is that hostility to the US as a foreign policy conviction is serving as part of the basis for a national identity in Russia. And it's legitimizing Putin's approach to ruling even in the absence of sustained economic growth. So while that, that approval for the first part of the 2000s was largely based on material conditions, that was not going to last forever. And what we see now is a shift to trying to build a legitimacy around this new form of national identity. It also serves as a way for Putin to justify his authoritarianism. He is using an aggressive foreign policy to reduce the likelihood that contentious, what I call elite constraining forms of political participation become successful not only in Russia, but in Russia's neighbors. So it's a way for Putin to try to keep democracy as far away from Russia as possible. And it's serving another purpose, which is that it's allowing him to recover from moments of negative popular support, or if, you know, dips in his approval rating, um, this, nat this more aggressive foreign policy is allowing him to recover from that um, and build his popular support in a new direction. Now, all of this ties then back to Putin as an individual. And uh, Brian Taylor, who's a, a scholar at Syracuse University, has written a very interesting book called The Code of Putinism. So I encourage you to take a look at it if it's something that you find interesting. But he says, you know, that what, what Putin has done is he's built this code and it's built around three general principles, great power statism, um, anti-Westernism or anti-Americanism, and a conservative anti-liberal approach to, to political life. And I would argue that the evidence that I have found from looking at the, the opinions of Russian elites tends to support his argument. It's not a, a data point that he uses in his book, um, but it, it does sort of suggest that what we're seeing here is it, it may be a Putin-led phenomenon, but he has a core of elite behind him that share these beliefs and are cueing the population as a whole to share those beliefs as well. Thank you. A couple of questions, a uh, couple of questioners have asked about uh, getting the elites to cooperate with the survey and uh, the, the process of, of getting uh, their participation in the opinion survey. So can you tell us more about that? Yeah. 
I would be happy to talk about that because it's, it's a very interesting question. So going back all the way to 1993, um, the originators of this of this survey, I'm, I'm not one of the principal investigators of it, although I've joined the advisory board of it, um, have worked with a, a trusted public opinion firm in, in Moscow. And this, um, this particular individual who's the head of this firm um, has cultivated a pretty wide circle of elites and um, uses that circle to start creating a frame of all possible people that they would like to interview um, and approaches them. The surveys are completely anonymous, and that contributes to um, a pretty high uh, participation rate. So I want to say that they, uh, of the number of people they approach for an interview, I want to say they have a success rate of between 70 and 80 percent, which is much higher than you get sort of on average in, in public opinion surveys. I could be I could be a little bit wrong on that. But generally, generally speaking, getting people to participate has not been a problem. Um, although one thing that our the, the person who works on this um, has mentioned is that it's getting harder, right? So it was a lot easier to get people to talk to her in 1993 and 1995 than it is in 2016. At this point, I think it's the sort of thing where she has such a good reputation as people are aware that this is scientific work, that this is not a an attempt to get somebody to say something that... Um, could compromise their professional life. Uh, and so there's a lot of trust that, that goes into this. Um, that being said, I kind of suspect that if we didn't have this partner work with us in Russia, if we were try to, you know, if she were to say, you know, I'm, I'm retiring, I need to find, uh, we need to find another partner, I don't know that we would have that same access. I really do think that this is, has been established um, over time. And I think that that anonymity piece has been has been key. I am aware of the fact that there are several elites who have been interviewed multiple times, but having actually worked with the data set, I can't identify who they are. So they are really quite protected. <laughs> so you know, if it's the same person who has been interviewed in 1993 and then in 1995 and 1999, I can't figure out who they are in the data set. So um, I think that that has also contributed to a pretty high uh, response rate of this. Um, this is kind of a follow-up. Uh, so uh, one person asks how you uh, identify people as being part of the elite. And, and since you um, talked about the um, places where they work, um, I think what this is asking is how high up uh, do they have to be? So like what rank are the military people? That is a great question that I can only partially answer. So um, I I, I don't think that, that there is anyone in this survey who is at the ministerial level um, that's been interviewed. I do think that there are people at the deputy ministerial level that have been interviewed. Um, but yes, how high up do you have to be? So for media, it's my understanding that they, they are focusing primarily on people who work in the media. I think there's a cutoff in terms of they, they have to be sort of an, at an editorial level with a certain distribution. So, you know, just your average person who has a really interesting blog is not going to make sort of the, the elite cut. For science and technology, they're placed in highly ranked, um, their director level positions placed in highly ranked um, Russian Institutes of Science. For the economy, uh, <laughs> You know, this survey goes back to 1993, and since I was looking at all all groups, I um, had sort of this very basic five group subdivision, which is what they used in 1993. Now they actually make a distinction between people who work in state enterprises, um, people who work in private sector, and again, I'm it's my understanding that sort of the size of the firm is what determines um, the level of director or manager that they might approach in that field. Legislatives and executives, so it, legislators are members of the Russian National Parliament, and it, pe executives would be people who work um, in appointed positions within the executive branch of the, of the presidential administration. Um, in this kind of... Um a multifaceted strategy that you, you're talking about that uh, Putin and his leadership is using uh, to uh, drive a new narrative in Russia, what Taylor calls Putin's code. Um, so the question is, um, what role does Russian ethnic identity play in that, if any? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, and I feel ill-equipped to, to answer it completely. So I will answer it sort of to the best of my knowledge. One of the things that um, Boris Yeltsin 
tried, I think, rather unsuccessfully to do in the 1990s was to build this civic sense of, of identity. And within the Russian language, there, there are two different words that we in English translate as Russian. And one of them is um, has a root that is intimately tied to a sense of an ethnic identity. Um, and another is a word that is a more general word for Russian, and, and that's actually, the, it's the same word, you know, the official name of Russia is the Russian Federation, the Rasiskaya Federatsiya in Russian, and that actually ha is, does not have an ethnic connotation to it, it has a civic connotation to it. One of the things that, and, and, and I think Yeltsin tried really hard to build this sense of this civic identity, uh, and I don't believe that it was very successful. Uh, some of the work that I did in my first book on constraining elites, I, which was based on um, these really extensive interviews that I did with a subsection of the Russian population, the very last question that I asked them was, what is your national or ethnic identity, which is a little bit of a loaded question in Russia, because in the Soviet period, um, people actually had to write their identity in their passports. Um, and that could be a basis of, of discrimination. Um, and so that's why I made it the very last question in my interview, was I never wanted to, it to close down how open people were with me. And, but I'd never expected this to become sort of what it became as a question, which was I did have a number of people who answered in this non-ethnic term. They used this civic Russian term. They, they, they identified it with, with it very strongly. Um, what I think has happened in, 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 in Putin and in Putin's Russia, and this is getting more to the question that was asked, is a focus maybe a tiny bit less on the ethnic component of the ethnic identity, but a number of other cultural attributes that go along with it. A key one being Russian language. A second one being Orthodox Christianity. So rather than sort of building it in a sense of a Russian ethnic identity that would exclude people who are not, who do not hold that, and, and again, something that is a fact we often really glide over in the United States is Russia is one of the most multi-ethnic countries in the world. And there are hundreds of different nationalities that live within Russia. Anybody in theory could adopt this this new Russian identity by adopting orthodoxy and by being Russian language, Russian language users. But it still is tied around this, these cultural attributes and this, I would say, a very conservative understanding of those cultural attributes um, as opposed to a more civic identity that has to do with an attachment to some particular set of uh, political or civic principles. Uh, to what extent do you think that some of the um, down a decrease in support for democracy uh, from the 90s on is a result of the shock therapy and uh, the, uh, the role that Boris Yeltsin and his disputed 1996 election played? A lot. Um, I think that, and this is based on, again, the work that I did for my, my first book, um, I found that if you ask people, if you ask uh, your average Russian to uh, define democracy, um, you'll get a lot of different interesting uh, definitions. But one of them is often chaos, right? They associate democracy with a lack of order. There's an excellent book written by a scholar, um, Ellen Carnahan, that's called Out of Order. And she specifically looks at um, looks at this particular phenomenon, how it is that Russians made sense of their political and economic lives in the 1990s. And so I do think that that, that decline in democracy or that support for Putin has to do with, in, in many respects, the support of ending the chaos of the 1990s. At the same time, I think that's a little bit of an oversimplification, okay? And, and this is where I think it's important to think about what freedoms have been preserved versus which ones have been taken away. So if we think back to the Soviet Union, there was very limited political, economic, and social freedom. So at, you know, and, and social freedom is something we don't often think about, but something is, as simple as being able to travel to another city in your country and look for a job there. That was something that you still needed to have government permission to do. Being able to go on vacation in, on a beach that's not in your country was something you needed to have a certain amount of, of political um, clout to be able to do. And so one of the things that I would argue Russians really wanted in the 1990s was freedom. 
And freedom and democracy are not the same thing. So people got lots of different freedoms. And they learned that some of those freedoms they really liked and some of them they could do without, right? So they really liked the freedom to be able to go abroad. They liked being able to go on vacation in Turkey and Egypt. Um, they liked being able to ha work for competitive wages. So they liked that if they were really good at their job, they could be promoted and get paid more. Um, they liked that. Um, they did not necessarily like having certain social guarantees taken away. Um, and when it came to political freedom, they were largely indifferent. And that's sort of one of the, the key things that I think is, it speaks to this, was that when Putin gradually took away these political freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and gradually constrained elections, there wasn't a lot of pushback because those weren't the freedoms that people cared about. I have often hypothesized, <laughs> um, I have often hypothesized that if we really wanted to see a reaction against Putin, he'd really need to take away people's ability to travel within the country and outside of the country, because that's a freedom that people have really, really started to latch onto. And he'd have to take away their ability to work for competitive wages, because that's something I think in particular the younger generation has really, um, it's a freedom that they now expect in their lives. Great. OK, well, we'll finish up with this question. Um, Danielle, I'm sure you'll find it very simple and straightforward. <laughs> um, so what should the US be doing with regard to Russia? Uh, how might we constructively engage uh, with a country that's dominated by anti-Americanism? So simple, indeed, right? Um, so <laughs> you know, I. I would be lying if I said I, I stay awake nights thinking about this, um, because it's, it's not true. Um, but I, I do think that uh, there, is some real, uh, there is some real potential for constructive engagement. Uh, and I think it primarily, honestly, where I think we could really see it the most is in areas of nuclear security. So where we, and what's really interesting about this is, you know, United States continues to maintain the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Russia maintains the second largest nuclear arsenal in the world. And the differences in the sizes between our two nuclear arsenals is pretty dramatic. Um, and Russia has little to gain, actually, from an economic or security perspective by increasing its, nu its nuclear arsenal. But it's going to continue to want to do that until there can be sort of the uh, more constructive engagement with other nuclear powers. And some of the areas that I think we've seen the strongest US-Russian cooperation historically have been on issues of nuclear security and safeguards. And Anyone that would think that Russia genuinely wants a nuclear North Korea or a nuclear Iran is deluding themselves, right? These are places actually where there can be very constructive space for dialogue. Um, now, honestly, I think the biggest obstacle to that is not Russia, but I think it's the current U.S. presidential administration. And, the, and, and, this, and, and this says less honestly about the president himself and more about the way that he has approached diplomacy and the way that he has approached working with his own executive administration. So we've seen numerous instances where people within the presidential administration of the United States, I think, have tried very hard to make progress on important security matters to then not have the president follow their advice or read their memos or, 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 or those sorts of things. Um, and you know, Putin is a very smart man. He's very aware of this. Um, so I think that that's sort of the, the I, honestly, I think this is the bigger, bigger challenge that we're, we're dealing with, is finding a way for there to be consistent policy coming out of Washington so that Russia can actually feel like they're dealing with a reliable partner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Challenge met, eh? Uh, <laughs> good answer. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, Danielle. And uh, let me also thank our sponsors once more, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program, and Public Policy Center. We're very grateful for your support. Also, the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. Thanks to today's special sponsors, Midwest One Bank, Alan Swanson, Blank and McCune Realtors, and John Menninger. Uh, thanks again to City Channel 4 for making our program programs available to viewing audiences. Uh, Danielle, as a small token of our appreciation, uh, it's my pleasure to present you with what we like to call the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. <laughs>